this is the superior. He's the heir of all things. He made the world. He's the radiance of God's glory, exact representation of God's nature. He's deity. He upholds all things by his word, by his power. He made purification for our sins, brethren, and he sits at the right hand of God. And how about this? He's better than angels. He's superior to angels. The writer tells us long ago that God spoke through the prophets. But now he speaks through his son. And as the father noted in Matthew 17, and verse 5, as the son was transfigured, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And because of who he is, the writer says something in our reading this morning about all this. Chapter 2. I want you to look with me at verse 1. We're just going to read the first a few verses together this morning, but there's a lot here for us to consider. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Look at verse 1. For this reason, he says, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. For this reason, you know that reason, hearkening back to what we've already discussed, the reason being who Jesus is what Jesus has done. Because God is speaking to us by his son for this reason, he says, you pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Listen. Brethren, are we listening? Uh, those of us who are parents, I was talking to Brother Allen uh, yesterday afternoon, and we were talking about our kids, and how you can tell them to do something. Five minutes later, they're, they're doing the very thing you just told them not to do. I can remember as a kid, my parents lamenting this. And it's not because uh, they're rebellious. It's not because they're wanting to displease us. It's not because they're defiant necessarily. I guess sometimes they are. But most of the time, they're just not listening. Um, and, and how often, brethren, do, does God feel this way about us? Oh, he sees us busy. He, he sees us studying. He sees us worshiping. And those are wonderful things. He, he sees us listening to, to sermons and even going to classes. But I think sometimes the question has to, has to become, are we listening? You know, there's a difference in, in just participating in those things, but not actually listening. And here's why God wants us to pay much closer attention to what we've heard. But read verse 1 again. He says, for this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard. Why? So that we do not drift away from it. That's the point. So that we don't drift away from it. Well, what's the solution for not drifting away from it? Paying closer attention to what we've heard, listening. You know, when you think about drifting, well, what's the problem with drifting? Well, I'll tell you, you know, we don't necessarily know what's happening, right? The danger with drifting is it's subtle. It happens slowly over time. Uh, most of us have, have experienced drifting, and, and my mind uh, immediately um, associates it with those times I, I've been in the ocean. Maybe you started in one place lost your focus, you closed your eyes on a raft, just relaxing a little bit. And a few minutes later, you, you open up your eyes, and what happens? You're not paying attention. You, you could be way further out or down the way than, than you could have even imagined with little to no effort on your part as a result of the current. You drifted, because you didn't even know you were drifting. I want you to think about the people we know and love who have drifted from the Lord. Did it happen overnight? didn't. It was subtle, sometimes so subtle that even those who, who love them and, and are fairly mindful of them didn't even maybe notice. It was subtle. You see, brother, we have to be intentional, paying close attention to the words of Jesus, to the gospel. You know, he brings up the, the words spoken through angels there in, in verse 2, and this is a reference to the giving of the law of Moses at Sinai. Passages like Deuteronomy 33 and Galatians 3 and Acts 7, they all affirm the fact that the law was delivered by angels. And the writer describes the law there, delivered as unalterable, it was reliable, it was um, God serious about obedience and, 
and, and, and disobedience and punishment for, for, for disobedience. And he reasons in verse 3, if you read it again, he says, For if the word spoken through angels proved, uh, this verse 2, proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. Uh, verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect some great salvation after it? It was at the first spoken to the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard. I want you to appreciate the logic. If the law of Moses was, was that important to God, serious to God, that he wouldn't overlook rebellion and disobedience to it. He's arguing here, I guess you could say from the lesser to the greater, how much more displeased must God be for one to ignore or even be lukewarm in one's response to Jesus in response uh, to the gospel? Do we, do we think that, that, that this same God is, is not going to punish those who neglect the gospel who neglect uh, salvation. Brethren, we can neglect so great salvation. And we can expect God to punish those who do that. You know, brethren, our, our salvation made possible by Jesus is great. It's great because it provides us the eternal life, the sinner. You know, Jesus, he, he, he first spoke about it. The inspired apostles and prophets proclaimed it. And with signs and, and wonders and miracles, God revealed his mind and will and, and confirmed that it was truly his will from him through gifts of, of the Holy Spirit. But yes, our salvation, our great salvation in Jesus Christ, our, our Messiah come to earth, takes on flesh, dies on the cross for our sins, resurrects on the third day from the grave, ascends back to heaven where he sits on the throne of all authority with the promise that he's going to return for his church, eternal life for, for the faithful. And that's great. That's a great salvation. But isn't it true? We can neglect it. You know, we sometimes forget what Jesus has done for us, right? And that forgetfulness often leads to ingratitude. And that ingratitude leads to apathy, and that apathy sometimes even leads to apostasy, if not repentant of it. And what I've just described very briefly is it's the essence of drifting, brethren. It can happen to us if we're neglectful. We allow other things, the cares and stuff of this life, to consume ourselves and our minds to the point that we neglect spiritual growth. We, we, we neglect to be intentional by way of growing our faith through a study of God's word. We're busy and we're distracted and other things become more important. And all the while, we're drifting. I'll leave you with this. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's a really good question. Are you drifting? Are you growing? Are you stronger than you were Last week, last month, last year, five years ago. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Verse 1, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away from it. Let's do that. Let's be about that. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Father, for another day in your word. Father, we're so very thankful. Father, we ask you at this time to be with us. So many of us struggling right now with various things. Bless us, Father, in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.